Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the virtual version of the Local Writers Showcase Poetry Contest Reading. Uh, my name is Rotem Benai, and I am a marketing and communication specialist for Bethesda's Urban Partnership. Uh, several members of our team are also here tonight, uh, both from the marketing team and our executive director. Um, so thank you guys for joining us. Uh, so since this year is a little different uh, and we're honoring our poetry winners virtually, uh, we strongly encourage the audience to use their chat function um, to congratulate and support our readers. Uh, the Local Writers Showcase is just one of the great community events that um, Bethesda Urban Partnership offers. We are a nonprofit organization that handles all of the maintenance and marketing of downtown Bethesda. On behalf of Bethesda Urban Partnership, I would like to thank the many, many, many talented writers who submitted to the poetry contest this year. Um, this was the 16th year that we have hosted a writing contest and the 10th year specifically for the poetry contest. We received almost 300 entries, and tonight we're here to listen to the top finalists that were selected. Uh, we would like to thank the Writer Center for their support um, for the contest and providing memberships and classes to, the to tonight's top winners. Uh, all poems will be published on the Writer Center's blog as well as our website at www.bethesda.org. Uh, joining me currently on screen is Grace Cavalieri, this year's Poetry Contest Judge. Um, and just a quick note, as we introduce each reader, um, we will be bringing them up on screen. Um, so just know that whoever you're here for will be joining shortly. Uh, so before we begin, we would like to start off with a couple of readings from award-winning poet Grace Cavalieri. Um, Grace Cavalieri is the Maryland State Poet Laureate and the author of 20 books and chat books of poetry. The latest are Other Voices, Other Lives, and Life Upon the Wicked Stage, a memoir. She's also written texts and lyrics performed for opera, television, and film, and has had 26 plays produced on American stages. Uh, Grace has <laughs> poetry workshops throughout the country. She's received the 2013 George Garrett Award, the Penn Fiction Award, the Allen Ginsberg Poetry Award, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting Silver Medal, and awards from the National Commission on Working Women. Um, the DC Poet Laureate Award from Dolores Kendrick, the Patterson Lifetime Achievement Award, and many others. Uh, so please welcome me in joining Grace Cavalieri. Thank you, Ro. I did not write that. I just want everyone to know. <laughs> Thank you so much for that introduction. The, the treat I had in February was to receive this huge packet of some 300 pages, beautifully organized, beautifully categorized. It was just such a pleasure because I was a little bit wondering how it would appear. I have enjoyed every one of those poems. The, it's so exciting tonight to see the faces of the poems that I like the most. And in fact, they're, they've been on my desk since February, so tonight's a big night for me. Um, you asked that I read a few poems, and I will read just a handful. And um, I'm going to start with something which was a writing exercise for my students, which is um, I give, I insist that everyone who works with me writes a poem every morning, and they call it a morning poem. And I give them 10 words to use in that poem. They can use it any way they want. So this is my attempt at a morning poem. And I forget if my words, I think my words were like dream, fish, lightning. I can't remember all of them. But here's my morning poem. Each of us has a pond. Mine is deep. I sleep beneath the water in a silence so clear the bloom of desire melts from me. Lightning turns fire to the water of pleasure. Fish are jumping in my heart. No, they are real fish dreaming of me. No, it is not a dream. This is a real heart. And another exercise I give my students is to go into the elevator of their lives, pretending their lives are a building, going into the elevator, stopping and looking at a certain floor, getting out and finding what's going on there and writing a poem about it. So I took the elevator in my own 
building of my life and it stopped on floor three. And this is exactly what happened. Language lesson. It was a day much like this, gray with drizzle. My mother took me visiting, which was a big event. She didn't drive a car, seldom went out. How did we get there? My father, perhaps, who worked in a bank nearby, he must have dropped us by this large white house with grand pillars. I can't imagine why we were wanted there, but I met a boy my age. I suppose that was it. Get the toddlers together, ready to learn to play. I assessed the toys and took my pick, a brand new trike, and oh, how it went, as shiny as it looked. My new playmate ran crying, filled with envy and complaint. Me wants the bike. Me wants it now. I stopped. The wheels froze on the rug as I looked at my foe. Me wants the bike? Me wants the bike? I felt the sweet pleasure of superiority. The first ache of it, age three. There would be no contest. I could play as long as I liked. I had him by the pronoun. It was the happiest day of my life. So that's the elevator exercise, which brought me to a real event where I found out that little girls talk before little boys. Um, this poem is called How a Poem Begins. It's a little thing. Could be the long O's in Kosovo or a woman alone in the street after the hurricane sweeping Honduras. Perhaps we tell of the child beneath the flood in New Orleans or feet bloody from walking the rubble of Afghanistan. They say poetry is insignificant. Such a tiny voice, no one can hear. Sometimes it says, I can't breathe. That's why we rate us such little things, insignificant. I'm going to shift gears. Um, I had a 60 year marriage, and so I'm going to read a few poems about that. This is called Why They Stay Together. It has an epigraph by Hilda Doolittle, which says, take snow in my arms. First, there was a powdered sugar covering all thoughts like a winter storm in the ghetto. Then the weight of the trees around the house, roots entangling, growing through the chairs, wood conspiring to connect, to keep them there. Finally, it was the crooked hands that matched just right. The loose doorknob and twisted key inside the burnished lock was in the frame. At last it was their sleep intertwined, as if it were planned that way, as if it had somewhere to go. Um, following up is called Advice Regarding a Field of Reindeer in the Snow. If your husband is sleeping, you can leave him a message and go in the airplane with a mysterious pilot just for an hour to land in strange cities, farmlands perhaps with wet leaves and wooden howls with ruffled curtains. You may walk to the edge of what you thought was a forest and look through a thick wall of ice with a gigantic hole and see field after field of reindeer brushed with snow standing still, how beautiful like frozen statues, cold and silent, each staring straight at you. Line after line of them, a sight you'd never have seen had you stayed home. You'll never forget it. But remember to leave a note before you go, or your return will be bleak. It will ruin everything. Trip, field, reindeer, snow. Um, my husband and I, met in junior high school number three in Trenton. So I always tell people to be careful who you go to the senior prom with. And um, this is called safety. When you were in the ninth grade and I was in the seventh, you were a crossing guard keeping order at junior high school number three. No one was disobedient when you wore that wide yellow strap across your chest. No one bruised another, caused trouble, or so much as threw a stone. No one cracked a joke about you, a man in uniform. 
How did that yellow vest feed your soul to let you know someday you'd fly a plane just to feel the power of a strap across your chest? What liberation to know how to be in charge, strong and capable, flying through gunfire and lightning again and again to come back to me. Although we were young, you were 15 and I was 13. Since then, I've never known the world without you. Now I must be 12. And I'm going to end with um, this poem. Work is my secret lover. It has an epigraph. Jasmine even referred to sex as work. Some primitive people believe that death is work. Work takes the palm of my hand to kiss in the middle of the night. It holds my wrist lightly and feels the pulse. Work is who you find with me when you tiptoe up the stairs and hear my footsteps through the shadows. You'll see me lift my arm to stretch and then lean down to put my head to it. Work threatened to die once for all that was left unsaid. So I took to it like a young bride flushed with excitement. Adultery too, yes, I admit it. On the holidays, when others gathered at the table, I was dreaming of it, making love to the movement of paper, the words from my lips, the feel of it. Sometimes when company came, I'd throw a tablecloth over my work and set the plate, and everyone acted as if nothing were visible, pretending I was the good hostess that I was. While on the Christmas tree, work waited patiently among ornaments, gleaming like a groom. I am guilty as charged, for nothing else could buy my feelings. And why would I sell the only thing that ever loved me the way I loved back? But my beautiful, long-lasting, faithful lover, my friend who will never leave. Thank you, Ro. Now I hope to hear others. <laughs> yes, uh, so now we would like to begin recognizing our young poets. Um, so please join me in welcoming Naomi Louie, a junior at Richard Montgomery. Hi. Um, tonight I'll be reading my poem, Storage Space. I have only ever memorized the things that do not matter. Formulas, recipes, two roads diverged in a yellow wood. Plato was born in 423 BC. Arrivederci, neon number 10. Stacks of words and numbers in the storerooms of my head. The taste of sand, these insignificant stones. You, a mountain, monolith, martyr, vast and unmappable. I cannot plot the crags, the cracks, the crooked canyon of your mouth, the scar from when you were five and brave etched into one of your elbows. I don't remember which. Car plus tree equals crumpled tin can on fire. Your hair the color of chestnuts, streaked through with toffee across the lines of straighter, darker trees. The concrete, you then. The abstract, you now. I throw coins into the fountain and make too many wishes. Carbon, number six, composes everything that lives, or that once lived. I'm counting your eyelashes, tracing the bridge of your nose, combing through the dust, searching for the slightest glimpse of you, a single fleeting smile. Uranium, volatile, gaining and losing and gaining and losing. And I draw you in my dreams a million times, always in the wrong colors. Thank you. so much Naomi. Um, so next uh, please congratulate uh, Tina Karpatkin, a senior at Walter Johnson. Hi, thank you so much. This poem has become especially important to me lately because um, my mentor who helped me edit it and has mentored me this last year, passed away in March. So this is sort of, 
this has become very important, he was going to attend. Um, so I'll begin. So I booked it on over to Kansas, but the only thing that disturbs the endless pale gold is the occasional sagging minivan driving the long way through from the Rockies. A man clapped my shoulder, after my own heart, he said, and I did the jobs no one wanted to do and sunburned my back bright red. I hitchhiked from nowhere to North Dakota, where I met a woman with 13 children and a husband with a face so stern the woman used it to sharpen knives. She took me out yonder to show me how to garden and nothing so cold their neighbors could only plant grains, her eyes as gray as her long acres, and I watched her plant marigolds. <clears throat> they rented me a red convertible out to Ohio, where I was told I'd get some deep scent breakfast if I asked for it. I met an old pastor when I ran out of money and he gave me bus tickets to Illinois. But it smells like there's a pig slow roasting on a spit around here, and I think I heard someone say the old observatory's haunted. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you, Tina. So before we hear from the honorable mentions of the adult poetry winners, uh, we want to welcome one of our guest poets, uh, Jose Padua. Um, Jose's first length book, first full length book, sorry, A Short Story History of Monsters was chosen by former poet laureate Billy Collins as the winner of the 2019 Miller Williams Poetry Prize. His poetry fiction, sorry, his poetry, fiction and nonfiction, have appeared in publications such as BombSalon.com, Beloit Poetry Journal, um, Another Chicago Magazine, and Unbearables. He was a featured reader at the 2012 Split This Rock Poetry Festival and won the New Guard Reviews 2014 Knightville Poetry Prize. Uh, so please welcome uh, Jose. Hi, thank you, Ro. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I'll read a few poems for you. Um, this first one is called Thieves Like Us. <clears throat> when a civilian once asked me who in the world of poetry do you trust, I said no one. We are always telling each other lies, I said, creating metaphors for the things we'll never be, lines that cloak our faults and weaknesses and turn them into the characteristics and idiosyncrasies of warm, sensitive beings and rhythms that lead our audience to believe we are saints when we are thieves out to steal your wives, your boyfriends, your summer cottage, your, <clears throat> your tickets to see Patrick Stewart in a play by the late Harold Pinter, who, although he was a playwright, had the heart of a poet, which is why we're still keeping an eye on him. Although I have never stolen a wife, a ticket, or even a plot of real estate on which stood a dilapidated brick building. I have in the past stolen books and sundries from unsuspecting shopkeepers who didn't know I was a poet and therefore didn't know enough not to trust me. I spend my days planning lovely thefts and robberies, each more daring than the last because I have so far to go to catch up with my contemporaries. I stand on street corners looking left and right as if I'm waiting on a friend when I'm actually deciding what to steal next. You will know I am done when the color of the evening sky skips a tone on the way from blue to dark blue. You will know I am gone by the steady beating of your broken by our hearts. Yeah, I almost said broken bones there. I almost messed up. This next one is called Notes for the Coming Revolution. If I were better at facilitating meetings, I might have something resembling a career by now. If I could pursue a lifestyle instead of just being alive, my coworkers might be more comfortable sitting near me at lunchtime when I open my brown bag and fill the air with the aroma of cinnamon and garlic. If I thrived in a fast-paced work environment and excelled at putting out metaphorical business fires, I'd have an office with a window looking out over the alley behind the building, which is where the rats play at night. If I could troubleshoot like a feasibility study conducted by a creepily upbeat subcontractor, I'd have a parking space and season tickets for every professional sports team in town. If I could apply the word synergy in a sentence while speaking with the boss and not laugh hysterically and make it look like I'm trying to help, 
I could be making millions of dollars by now, but of course I'm not. You are, and I am coming to take your verbs away. And this last one is uh, uh, about when I was uh, living in Front Royal, Virginia and uh, writing a blog there, and I would sometimes get some comments that were less than friendly and kind. And this one is called Memo in the Form of a Sonnet to the White Supremacist who referred to my wife as a breeding vessel for the Hispanic invasion. Despite my name being Jose, I'm not Hispanic, but Filipino, which means that as far as you're concerned, my white wife is not a breeding vessel for the Hispanic invasion, but for the Asian invasion. Please take note of this. Because the Asian invasion and all the other invasions you fear are gaining strength like tropical depressions. And as the days go by, your vessel will lose more and more of its buoyancy, more of its ability to breed, which means as far as my wife and I are concerned, that there's still hard, hard work to be done. That, like a sturdy vessel riding high upon the waves, we will continue to float. Thank you. So now we will hear from the honorable mentions. Uh, please welcome Barbara Oppenheimer from Chevy Chase, Maryland. Hi. Um, the poems, the title of the poem is What Remains? Not showing. Um, hmm. Am I not showing? No, we just sent you another camera request. Now I'm showing. Turn off your webcam. No, I didn't. It says share my webcam. Should Say I do yes. that? Say yes. Okay. There we go. Okay. Yep, we can the title is What Remains? Film of crumbs on baking pan, chocolate smudge on recipe card, silver cake plate bruised through use, rusted skis in cellar, hiking boots thinned by time, kayak paddle marred and cracked. She adored late afternoon light, enjoyed the smell of skunks, shared all that she loved. In her bureau's bottom drawer, a stack of Mother's Day cards, many birthday wishes. We thought we owned her memories, desires, warmth, yet pushed under the paper liner, two yellowed love letters signed by a stranger. Beautiful, thank you, Barbara. Uh, so next we will hear from another honorable mention, um, Adam Tomaszewski, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, from Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, we can't hear you one second. There we go. Is that working? Yep. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor. So thank you very much, Miss Miss Cavallari. Uh, I'd like to dedicate this poem to my wife. I don't write a lot of love poems um, just because I'm mostly afraid of, of doing them badly. So I appreciate uh, the recognition of this one. Yesterday was our 19th uh, wedding anniversary. So I dedicate this to my wife, Sarah. Uh, and you'll see why. It's called For Scythia. We once approached Rome by an ordinary street named the Way of the Butterflies. In Tuscany at that villa, we parked in an asphalt lot and took a cracked sidewalk to meet Jacobo. And how many weathered boardwalks have we walked before facing the wild Atlantic? Even these children of ours, we arrived at by the most unassuming route some furtive kisses. I want you to understand that I'm approaching our own epic when I remember the dappled afternoon you turned your head, sweaty from a day of yard work, to look at the back fence and tell me 
we should plant the grass when the forsythia blooms. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so last but not least, for our honorable mentions, please welcome Elizabeth Singletary from Washington, D.C. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for this honor. I'm going to read my poem, Guess Who? When I see you, I don't see color. With my hue so dark, what do you see, I wonder? A soul drained of hope and promise, a debilitated spirit because of your blindness, a faith shattered from years of pain, dreams not realized, nothing to gain. My complexion has been my shield and sword. It's given me courage to defeat your words. When you looked past me, you didn't see the courageous warrior that dwelt within me or that shade of darkness that took flight and became a maher that still shines bright. An indomitable spirit you chose to ignore has value and worth that will make your eyes soar. These words were written for you to consider. If you opened your eyes, would you see my color? Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. So before we hear from our first, second, and third place winners, uh, we want to welcome another guest poet, uh, Nishi Chawla. Uh, she is a academian and a writer. She has six collections of poetry, eight plays, and two novels to her credit. Her poetry has been published in various American journals. Uh, Nishi holds a PhD in English from the George Washington University and has received a citation from the state of Maryland in 2018 in recognition of her dedication to the arts and theater. Please welcome Nishi Chow. Oh. Uh, Nishi, we, we can't hear you. Uh, let me. I think we can hear you now. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. In light of the recent events uh, in the United States, I wish to read two poems. One is titled Discolored, and the other is titled Rooted. Uh, this is from our sixth volume of poetry titled From Immigrant Diaries. I just want to kind of suggest that as long as racism is a problem in society, colorism will likely continue to be so. Uh, discrimination based on color remains a problem worldwide with victims turning to desperate remedies to buffer themselves against one another. Increasing one's awareness of colorism and understanding its practices may help counter the historical abuses and wrongs that colorism promotes. My poem is titled, Discolored. Yesterday afternoon, the sun spoke to me, slowly, lazily, cheekily, carefully checking me for after effects with its flash bulb scans. I looked back at the glowing red, befuddled, my captive soul knew a riptide for its message. Why would I wear safety eyewear? For we are all birds in flight, loosened upon a fissured planet, branded by the color of our skin tone and type. I cling to my roots that turn into a new answer, cut loose, my fate blooming in brown earth, my pain turns into no response. Like a black slash of lightning, somber messenger of fate. I'm my own little garden, content to be raking my kind of grass, and the plants do not question adrift in my shadow, nor off color, or which color, those dreadful clocks of colorful, colorless seasons, sealed. I hate the piece of coloring and its weird lies, endured beyond the black like me poppings, I scream with pain, squeak, throw buckets of water, a voyager on green mountains, sunblocked. Another poem I'm going to read from this volume is titled, Rooted. We see them for a moment, those kernels, 
and then they disappear, teasing us with their material content, leaving us with a kind of dissatisfaction, underground nodes of ourselves, cut off, exploded, multiplied. Then, having read about Asvata, the cosmic tree in divine self-regard, we may reverse direction, hanging on with supernatural force, live loose, forever, otherwise alone, adrift. There is always a horizontal axis. The axis has always been there, holding up toward the blue sky and the brown earth, carefully diagrammed, sometimes pushed vertically up. The way the branches grow, neither cut down nor up, but fall naturally, foot loose at the beginning, when those guardian angels go amok, absolutely. They have the gift of reminding you that the amplitude of life runs a downward course, hardly improved by sharing thoughts. Only memories blend, puzzled, gathered. They come into being, then pass out their vascular order in leaves, branches, veins. The ancient wisdom gets distributed, nor neglect the hidden secrets enshrined. We collect data of good and evil, trace their link with the underworld, land of the dead. We become their diverse voices, skins, race, untethered when the trunk separates. Thank you. Do I have time for uh, one or two? I do have time, thank you. I'm going to read some poems uh, based on the theme of the pandemic that all of us are, of course, experiencing, confronting, facing. Uh, my first poem is titled, Inside Myself. The virus licks my torn soul, guilt tripping me. I sing a love song to it, tempting the faint thump, causing my heart to fissure its fatty lumps. Pretend I live on a moon of my own landing, turn my flesh inside out, listen to the chirping of birds, amazed that so much beauty could still exist amid club-like spikes that crush the breathing soul, lavender storms that hit, unfounded hopes cluster phylogenetically, a pestilence that asks for enormous surcharges, lethal as the protein cry of daggers, stabbing me yet again, quietly slithering out a warlike stratagem as birds orchestrate their cheerful songs to each other. Embraced in positive sense RNA, the hard truths that no flowers on our window sills would relive, proteins that slice human voices, sliced lungs pause, then breathe. When I follow its replication pattern, somewhere a flood of tears ensue, attached to a host receptor, slyly, pursuing a purpose-driven path. Winter turns into stunned spring, and yet the stalk of the spike molecules sticks, digs deep within, encodes hollow dreams, hollowed out. In the open fields, the birds shriek with intense, tormented sounds, adopt a transmembrane-like structure, and more and more are rendered mute, transfixed fear, Packaging signals of sliding down, motionless companions that express the fear, triggering viral particles, spreading out, binding domains of dazed displeasure, disbelief, a tissue culture, receptors and protein that inject so much, a solar vision that gives me a new calm, a prayer that sparks new nucleocapsids of refined pleasure gone. I struggle with myself again, umpteen times more. My next poem is titled Infinite Karmas. Well, the Hindu concept of the karma that we uh, reap as we sow, uh, that's of course being challenged by the pandemic. And so my title is uh, Infinite Karmas. At the beginning was the outbreak, blobs of swarming virus caught red-handed, fasten themselves on human lungs above those karmic laws that got bled out 
The stars rip the effects of human invention, trade, trade. How one lives frontlined with gloves and masks, market causality, casually proliferate in invisible tweets with red, red mountain clouds, dismantle the short supply of legends that look comfort us for no reason. Does it clink a glass or two now that the karmic wheel got broken? Does it dodge bullets whittled by the dark scraping, bend its shape inside the deep flesh in cruel thumps, knowing no clear patterns of reactionary consequences, pacing oneself to match an invisible, fugue-like enemy that rings in waves of new energy in unison with the crevices the virus revisits, wild affliction, dead to the pangs of love, of lust, reaping the aroused days of its own self. Karma scapic bounds. There is the blind eye of fate here. Discriminate between willing it, nor etched, nor accrued, in discrete scoops, shields of our own actions generate flourishing between the responsible and the not so. Do I have time to read one more poem? Uh, yes, you can read one more. Thank you. Uh, the poem's titled Mutating. Well, we all know what mutating is, um, you know, given the present circumstances. At the turn of a metaphor, an old smell returns, doorknobs, food parcels, cardboard boxes violate its safety, coffins run amok, unwilling to settle into the ground of unequal notes, broken up, handshaking that combines dead or distancing. By sunrise singing, widows cut open fear from the clinging smell of soaps to peacetime talks of floating civil liberties of fixed then ripped. Destroy the game of winners and losers. Write love poems to battles fought, tactile as panic. Controlled eyes lifting, glisten with godhead. Its rhetoric is framed, unstable as molecules, moving, evolving, thinking unto oneself, deadly and pent up, galvanized into action fight, fleeing, quiver with soft gestures, smooth out as dream filaments, the labored action of digital steps, quiet, lingering gestures, sinking deep as surveillance. As the door shuts tight, breathing encircled, then intervene with the arc of biometrics, move freely between borders, strike back torrents of smart bombs, creep into bunker busters, masked under submarines, guns that maneuver through host cells, a blood flow bereft of motion. Would there be a mutating still? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so now we will hear from uh, third place, then second place, and then last but not least, our first place winner. Um, so please welcome me in third place, uh, Mary Kay Shane from Alexandria, Virginia. Hello. Am I here? We are here. We are just sending you a uh, video okay. request that we can yeah, we're okay. All right. Sorry. I'm very happy to be here and in such good company. Um, I'd like you to know that my poem was prompted by an award-winning photo at the National Gallery, the National Portrait Gallery. The photographer was Paul DeMato, and he had titled this portrait, Lillian, New Covenant Church of Deliverance, Chicago, 2011. And my poem I've titled, Portrait on the Brink. Wary, the girl, maybe 16, eyes us sideways from her photo on the museum wall. Palms on lap, fingers straight and angled upward, holding the tension between shooter and subject. Or aware, 
the young woman sits straight on the metal chair, a sliver of sunlight spotlighting her eyes loaded with questions. Appraises her photographer, poised as if ready to wing it at any moment, steadying her hands in the way a pilot tests the flaps, feels the power build just before takeoff. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, so now we will hear from our uh, second place winner. So please welcome Sean Murphy from Western uh, Reston, Virginia. Sorry. Okay, can you hear me? Great. Well, first of all, thanks to Bethesda Urban Partnership for this opportunity and for promoting poetry. That's a very welcome thing. And Grace, thank you so much for reading all the poems. And I, I'm certainly appreciative that you uh, selected me. Uh, I'm going to read my poem. It's called Notes from Underground. Uh, and it has an epigraph from the jazz musician Butch Warren, uh, who is actually a product of DC. And he was on several brilliant jazz albums throughout the 50s. And in 2013, I was sad to read his obituary um, and find out that for the last decades of his life, he spent time in psych wards, um, was largely unknown, and uh, kind of begged the question often asked, at least by, by myself, how many geniuses are walking amongst us unknown, uh, particularly from the artistic fields and particularly, um, you know, underrepresented uh, citizens amongst us. So this is called Notes from Underground and the epigraph from Butch Warren asks, don't I have the right to be crazy if I want to be? That woman cleaning high-rise offices after hours once bellowed the blues and speakeasies, pimps roaming the hoods in three-piece suits, tossing bills on stage like alms and collection baskets, a religious ritual from days when dead presidents could make cops colorblind. This janitor the middle school kids call Pops is the best guitar player nobody ever heard because only anointed cats signed by labels cut records and studio work wasn't near enough to keep the heat on in Philly or anywhere else you stopped to live when you weren't on the road. The invisible man catching mist from the car wash slipstream spent more money on cigarettes he smoked between sets than he makes in tips today, split 10 ways each shift with coworkers whose fingers get numb from buffing steel, the same way he ceaselessly scrubs memories from his mind. That defenestrated scarecrow sporting five coats and fewer teeth, who now counts time conducting traffic for change or else stalking the defunded psych ward, still hears the cheers from sold out gigs back when the blue note buzzed like a honeycombed fortress full of queens and soldiers, all extracting honey from air sticky with gold. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Uh, John last but not least, uh, our first place winner of the poetry contest, uh, Yasmin Salita Adlam from Bethesda, Maryland. I don't believe she will be able to join us via camera, but she is here. I have tried to share my webcam with you. Aren't you um, receiving it? Um, no, but we, we just sent you another request if, if it works. If not, it, it's okay. Of course it's okay. It's a poetry reading, not a sighting. Good evening, everyone. My name is Yasmin Solita Odlam, and I'm from St. Lucia. And I would like to, first of all, thank all of my friends from St. Lucia who have joined in today and thank Bethesda Urban Partnership for this award. And um, Miss Cavalieri, thank you very much for selecting me as your final list for the poetry competition. I indeed also want to express that um, I was very gratified to see one of the winners is my daughter's math teacher's daughter. So I was very happy to see her here today. And without further ado, 
I start the awakening. At the end of my marriage, I still see you as I did that day at Haynes Point, perpendicular and still quiet at the core, except for your huge hands feeding crumbs to the birds, fluttering furiously around you, frenetic to be fed. And you, being you, took your time, no matter how hard they flapped the air around you with urgency, you took your time. Such a decent man, even as things began to deconstruct and you knew that the day would come when I would no longer live without being alive and still be your wife. In the meantime, you withstood and I wandered through forks in the path, living in parallels and paradoxes you never understood. Such a dutiful man, wood solid in the wind and whimsy as I unwind from you, hankering for intangibles. Your open hand could never give. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. And again, congratulations to all of our finalists. And uh, Grace, I would, you know, if you would like to share any words with everyone, I'd love to give you the floor here. Oh, uh, hold one second. Let's make sure you're unmuted. No, we can't hear you yet. One second. Uh, it looks like you're self-muted. Okay, I think we're fine. Yep, yeah, there we are. We have triumphed over technology. Oh my gosh. I just want to say that from February, I have been cheered by this contest. Um, actually, February was the first indication that we had that there was going to be a pandemic. And then I read these poems and it took me a few weeks actually because they kept, first place kept bobbing up and then second place kept bobbing up and they kept warring with each other because they were really all excellent. So about March, I think I made some decisions and I've kept the folder on my desk. And once in a while, I look through it. And I feel I know each of these poems intimately. So what a thrill to hear them read by the winners. This has been a really bright spot in the pandemic. I've been isolated in this house since March. But this has been a, a great pleasure that you've brought me, Ro. Thanks a million. Bethesda rocks. Bethesda rocks. I'm telling you. You have some poets. Thank you for including me. Of course. Um, so thank you for being our judge this year. And thank you to everyone that submitted um, a poem this year. And we hope you continue to apply uh, for future years to come. Um, thank you all for joining us virtually. Um, we wish we could have held this in person, but hopefully next Maybe year next we will. Yeah, hopefully next year we'll be able to. Um, so special thanks again to Jose and Nishi for joining us and to all of the finalists. Um, we want so them to keep writing. Oh, they must keep writing. Please do. And we hope you all apply again next year. Um, so with that, I will wish everyone a good night. Thank you, Ro. Thank you so much.